Well, as I promised, uh, with me here in the studio is Jay Lake. Jay, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you, Mike. Nice to have you here. And it's surprising since you're from uh, Portland, Oregon, to get all the way out here to the East Coast, but we, we appreciate your coming by. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. The first thing I want to talk about a little bit is in 2004, you won the Campbell Award. Mm -hmm. And you won that based entirely on short fiction, which is kind of unusual these days. Uh, Rich Horton tells me I'm one of only two people who ever won it without having published either a novel or in one of the major digests first. Yeah, you're, so your career is kind of like, in a sense, a throwback. <laughs> you, you know, yeah. making your reputation on short fiction and now moving into novels. What is it that drew you to short fiction so much? Um, the opportunity to experiment. Um, also, quite frankly, the gratification cycle. You can, write a, you can write a short story in an hour a day, a weekend a week, get it out in the market, have it come back, sell it, and then see it in print in, the, in less than a year. That's not the case with novels, especially when you're starting out. So if you have kind of a short attention span like I do, short fiction is a much better place to play. Yeah, and, and you can go a lot of different places with it, too. Absolutely. I can go in, in any number of directions, horror, dark fantasy, high fantasy, science fiction, experimental. I, I can do, you know, in the course of a year, I can write in two dozen different voices if I want to. Yeah, that must be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we talked earlier, there's, there's a lot of voices in some of the books. I mean, you get, even in one collection like Dogs in the Moonlight, you've got science fictional stuff, you've got very dark horror, like The Goat Cutter no. is a very dark story. Where, where did that one come from? Um, believe it or not, it's kind of autobiographical. Um, oh, well, that's I'm, not, not in the precise details. <laughs> I was not, in fact, ever possessed by the devil personally. But uh, it's... Uh, it, it, comes from the fact that my mom used to own a goat farm in Central Texas. Ah. And if you've ever spent much time around goats, the rest of it makes a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And I lived in, my family's from Texas, I lived in Texas for many years. And that whole experience of sort of evangelism and, and that, that rural life, and not me personally, I'm a city boy, but it was definitely around me. Uh, yeah, and that's one of the things in a lot of your work is you get a real sense of place in it. But you've lived all over the place. Like Taiwan, was Nigeria. Yep moved around a lot when you were younger. Right? My, my father was a foreign service officer, so I was born and raised overseas, which I also think has a lot to do with the kind of fiction I write today. In, in what way? Well, um, one thing I think most Americans never really have is a sense of being significantly out of place. If you're born and raised and grow up in a, in a small town, even a big city somewhere, you have a sense of rootedness and a sense of belonging. Um, I think that science fiction and fantasy in general is about being out of place. It's thematically and often and overtly about the whole stranger in a strange land idea. And I grew up as a stranger in a strange land. And science fiction gives me a place to talk about that. Other forms of fiction did too. I mean, that's what Graham Greene was writing about all his life. But in some ways, in science fiction, you get to reset all the dials. You're not confined to the primary world. You're not confined to straight linear narrative. Right. And, and a lot of your works don't go straight linear narrative. I um, think in particular the, the story you had in uh, Helix, the uh, online magazine. Ah, yeah, Real North. Real, Real North. Which in fact is uh, a piece of world building behind my novel, Trial of Flowers, that has just now come out. Uh -huh. um, and I wrote it mostly to explore some aspects of the world, which doesn't overtly enter into Trial of Flowers. But yes, that was written in an extremely nonlinear fashion, mostly just to see if I could do it. Yeah, it's like a lot of different stories kind of... It's basically three together. guys who are figments of each other's imaginations. Yeah. And if you think about that for a minute, it makes no sense at all. But if you just read the story, it works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and Helix is a good place for a story like that. Absolutely. So you You've done a fair bit of online. Yeah, work. I've probably... I, haven't, I would have to go look, but I probably have 100 online credits by now. Yeah. And... Um, I don't personally make a distinction between online publishing and print publishing. The issue, the distinctions I draw in as much as I draw them have to do with, with pay rate and professional standing. And there are online markets like the late sci fiction or Bain's Universe or Strange Horizons that are unequivocally professional markets. And then there are online markets that are basically zines that don't happen to have paper behind them. Uh, but it's a, nice mar it's a nice place to work in, I think, because the kind of people that are moved to start and run online markets are a little bit more open maybe to innovation than people who are trying to service the existing established uh, fan, mar fan base. Yeah, they don't, they're <clears throat> not as beholden to, to advertising and, and needing to ship out stuff. They're, they're, the economics are different. Absolutely. I, it, it's just the, I mean, remember, I'm involved as an editor in the Polyphony Anthology series. True, yeah. Which we're up for our third World, world Fantasy Award. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. And I'm not the publisher, I don't have anything to do with the financial side, but I can tell you it's a book. Book costs money, even mm -hmm. if you do POD. Online is not free, but the relationship of the capital to the word, is very different. Most of the budget of an online market is in paying the writers. That is not true in a print market. Right. 
Right. You, you brought up polyphony, and um, that's you, you co-edit that with, um, check my notes. Deborah Lane. Deborah Lane, yes. Um, how does that collaboration work? Um, well, let's see. The sixth one is coming out at World Fantasy, mm -hmm. and it's worked differently six times now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very loosely speaking, we get the slush pile in. And for us, slush runs five or six hundred stories that we're going to winnow down to 15 to 25 stories because we're buying the volume length, not the story count. One or the other of us will read most of the slush. This year she read it because I was trying to finish a couple of novels for contract. Last year I read most of the slush. And then we pass back and forth the stories we like and we arrive at a consensus. Now her vote is always worth my vote plus one because she's paying the, paying the bills. So when we disagree and we can't work it out, we do what she wants to do. But if I want to do it differently, I can start my own publishing company. Kind of like being married. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so far, I think we've maybe come to a hardcore disagreement twice across six books. Wow. So That's it's a lot of stories. It's a lot of stories. And you know, last year we had one of our stories from number four get into Best American Short Stories, which was the first time a genre short fiction piece had jumped into BASS in about 17 years. Yeah. So that which, was a real feather. Was uh, Heart and Boot by Tim Pratt. Oh, Tim Pratt. Which he Tim. now has out in a collection called Heart and Boot and Other Stories. But that was, that was a real thrill for us. As an editor, I was terribly pleased. As a writer, I was terribly jealous. <laughs> so it was kind of a, a multiple, per, multiple personality moment for me. Yes, yes, yes. Now, what is the, the concept behind the polyph polyphony series? Well, the first volume, I believe, we subtitled Stories Beyond Genre. Right. And we were looking for, um, for want of a better term, what, what people have sometimes called slipstream fiction. And that's kind of a bad term because that term changes meaning every time somebody uses it. But the slightly better definition I can give you is science fiction or fantasy, genre fiction, written with strong literary values, or occasionally reverse, literary fiction that's written in a science fictional mode. Uh, and so it's a kind of story that you see cropping up occasionally in fantasy and science fiction. Uh, I think that Jeff Ford's creation, which ran in FNSF about four or five years ago, was a really good example of that. Yeah. Um, you see it occasionally in Asimov, you see it occasionally in some of the other markets, but nobody, no recurring market has been dedicated to it. There have been one-offs, like Kelly Link's Trampoline that covered it. And we wanted a recurring market that published those kinds of stories that we love to read and we just didn't see. And what's it like editing, putting together a uh, collection like that where it's, you're not the writer, but you're sitting over it and looking them over? It's kind of interesting. For one thing, as a result of the polyphony and the other little projects I've done, like Tell Stories and All-Star mm -hmm. Zeppelin Adventure Stories, I read a lot more unpublished short fiction every year than I read published short fiction because I read my own slush pile. And frankly, I don't have time to read. I think I figured out the other day there are about 13 to 1,500 professional short fiction pieces published in genre every year and about 600 novels. Guess how many of those I read? But I've read, you know, as much as a couple of hundred pieces out of that slush pile. I yeah. don't read every story in the slush pile because some of them I don't need to. Right. So that kind of infuses my thinking about fiction in ways that may or may not be good for me, but at least I'm not thinking about fiction the way everybody else with a subscription to a digest is. I'm looking at it a little differently. It's also given me a really keen awareness as a writer of what editors go through. So my expectations of the submittal process are probably a little bit different than they would have been if I'd never been an editor. Yeah, I would think so. So what kind of effect does reading all the slush, put it, you know, looking for the good stories, does that kind of infer anything into your own writing? Do you find yourself kind of being an editor while you're writing any of your stories? <laughs> well, um, I, I find myself being an editor while I do almost anything, Mike. I will pick up a commercially published book and read it simply for the sake of reading it. And I'll be like, <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> get out the pencil. And at the same time, one of the things that I try very hard to do when I'm writing, and I talk about this a lot in my blog, by the way, is mm -hmm. distinguish my editorial and marketing self from my writerly self. Because if I try to think about editing and marketing while I'm writing, that's the kiss of death. The voice that I treasure in my writing and that the market seems to like in my writing comes out of really going deep on that side of me. And so I have this sort of induced Chinese wall in my head between the two sides. Once I'm done writing a story, the editor brain goes to work. So on rewrite or edit or, or marketing decisions, I may be thinking like an editor. Uh, and, and a really simple example of that is looking at a market and saying, what's the demographic of this market? What kind of things do they publish? That I don't always follow that. I sold a science fiction story to Black Gate, which is a high fantasy market. So, you know, you can break those rules, but when you break them, you know you're breaking them. I probably wouldn't bother to send an elf story in analog. Yeah. Unless I thought it was a hell of an elf story and I could tempt Stan into publishing it anyway. Uh, so there is that sense, but it's all post facto. The writing, it lives in its own world. Yes. Speaking of your blog, um, in case you want to give a plug to your blog, it's... Um... It's, it's jlake, J-A-Y-L-A-K-E dot livejournal.com. Yeah. And I've got six or seven hundred readers now. And I talk about writing a lot. I talk about process. I write these little essays about how things work from my point of view. 
I talk about my own work for people that are interested in me. So I, I you know, I've been posting updates and work in progress snippets on the novel I'm writing right now. Um, and then I just, you know, I, pu I yesterday I published a link to a steampunk computer that someone had sent me on the internet. That was cool. Oh man, it was like something out of Brazil. <laughs> I want that thing, right? Or the, you know, weird automobiles or, or strange stories about about tech and science and. You know, occasionally, you know, political rants. Talk about my kid. Talk about my cats. Mm -hmm. It's a blog. Yeah, yeah. So. It's, it's a it's a blog. The 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 essays on the writing is interesting. Now, your your short fiction, you tend to write, boom, you just kind of go with it. It's a dump. It's very, I'm a very fast writer, just in terms of keyboard speed. So the short fiction is absolutely just a dump. And most of my short stories I've written at one, wrote at one sitting, and then however much editing they may require. A yeah. few required a lot. Most of them, I'm I'm lucky in that my first drafts are pretty clean. Novel, on the other hand, you, you really can't write a novel that way. I mean, yeah. I, I'm fast for a novelist, but it's not still not the same kind of writing. So it takes me four to six to eight weeks to write a first draft of a novel, depending on what's going on in the draft. Mm. Um, and then that's a, that's a different process from short fiction. It's still fast, but it's a lot more of an internal process. Now, let's say talk about rocket science a little bit, which is was your first novel, I believe. Yes, rocket science is my first novel. It uh, is short. I actually have I have actually described it a couple of times as a giant short story. Um, it does move. It's got the the kind of movement that way too. I mean, it, yeah. it just keeps going. Yeah, the whole thing takes place over about two days. Yeah, and it it primarily concerns two people, uh, and it's uh, it's been called the secret history of my family <laughs> because it takes place in my mother's hometown and uses some family history from my dad's family, my stepmother's family, and my mother's family to as backstory for the characters even a lot of the character names. Ah. I don't know if I want to know which of the characters <laughs> is which member of the family because there's some strange people there. In are there are some strange people, yes. It's a load of fun though. It's, it's in a sense kind of a throwback adventure story. Oh, it, it's my golden age story. Yeah. And, and I have gotten many emails from people wanting to know what happened next. Yeah. Give me a sequel. Yeah, what, yeah the characters, you want to know what, what happened with these guys. Well, yeah, because it ends with you know, the mother of all cliffhangers. Yeah. You know, they, they, they disappear. Yeah. And, I have thought about writing it and I thought, I kind of like the idea of them, you know, flying off into the sunset, so yeah. to speak, and not having to answer for their crimes. Yeah, and then the credits <laughs> roll. And <laughs> yeah, and we're done. I mean, yeah. do we really need to know? You know? Yeah. And I may come back to it someday. And it's not a question of money, you know, or something like that. It's just a question of, I think the characters are happier where they are without me bothering them further. Right, because it's, it's, you know, takes place post-World War II, just post-World yeah, War II. Yeah, Kansas, 1945, late, late summer, early fall. alien spaceships and Nazis and communists and... and, and you name it. It's all yeah. in there. Crooked politicians, yeah. bad doctors, it's, it's, car wrecks. It's, it's a trip. <laughs> and the thing is, you try writing a novel set in 1945 without using the words UFO or flying saucer. Yeah. <laughs> Which were not in currency in 1945. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Now, let's take a little time. I want to go in some of the, the newer novels you've got coming out. You've got from, I think it's Nightshade, you've got... Kind of the flowers. Trial of flowers. Trial of flowers. Where this just shipped literally yesterday. Right. And then next year, uh, Madness of Flowers, which is its sequel, will be out. And and these are kind of strange. Decadent urban fantasy. Decadent urban Publishers fantasy. Publishers Weekly called Trial of Flowers a grand guignol of perverse sex. Right. Which, which I definitely think I need makes to, me want to read it. I need it. that on a t shirt, right? <laughs> yes. And the cover has a guy riding a giraffe with people throwing roses at him, which is actually a scene lifted straight from the story. Um, it's basically that school of uh, China Mieville, Jeff Vandermeer, we weird urban fiction is what it falls into. And it's got everything from dwarves with their lips sewn shut to draft cavalry. Everything you want in a novel. Everything you want in a novel. Yeah. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's kind of Baroque, it's kind of decadent, and it was an enormous amount of fun to write. And I'm really, I've, I've got a good review in PW, I've got a good review in Booklist, I've got a good review in This One's Locust. All I need now is for actual people to actually read it. <laughs> yes. So Trial of Flowers, Trial of by flowers. the time this airs, Trial of Flowers should be out. Yep. And then it's Madness of Flowers coming out. Next year. Next year. And between the two, next June, I have my first tour novel coming out. A right. hardback called Mainspring. And Mainspring isn't like anything, which is kind of a marketing issue. Where I can say Trial of Flowers is like China Mieville. Mainspring is a high concept fantasy about a clockwork earth orbiting the sun on a brass track. And mm. the spring is running down, hence the title. And uh, Clockmaker's Apprentice is visited by the Archangel Gabriel who sends him to rewind the mainspring of the world. And so it's sort of a religious quest fantasy and it's steampunk. It's set around 1900 in, a, in an earth ruled primarily by Victorian England. Their, their uh, contester for power is Imperial China. And there are airships and, and Neanderthals and all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And of course, lots and lots of clockwork. Yeah. So that's, oh, that's fun. fun. And that will either, I think, 
fall flat on its butt or do pretty well because it's one of those things that you can't say if you like this, you'll like that. You just have to pick it up and look at yeah. it. But it has the most beautiful cover. I swear to God, Stefan Martinier, who does a lot of tour covers, did a painting for this thing that made my jaw drop when I saw it. Wow. And I think there's a sequel in the works? Stemwinder. Stemwinder. Which I am, in fact, working on right now. I'm, ah. in the mid I'm in the middle of writing Stemwinder. I was working on it this morning. And I have to deliver that sometime next spring. That'll be out in June 2008. So I've got two series booing, two fantasy series. And if the first books in either one do well enough, they will probably be book threes as well. And of course, as I was telling you before the interview, I, one of my arguments with Tor after they bought Mainspring was I wanted my second book with them to be a space opera because I write that too. And uh, they really wanted me to have a book that followed the first book so that if it gets traction in the market, people will know what they're looking for and build the Jay Lake brand. Mm -hmm. So I suspect if I want to publish space opera, I'm gonna have to find another name or something. Yeah, yeah, or just set up another series. I mean, it sounds like the Flowers books and the Mainspring books are very different. They are very different from each other. And in fact, I have to work not to have the voices leak mm -hmm. over a little bit. Yeah. You know, the, the Mainspring books, both books are from the point of view of teenagers, essentially. And they're not particularly decadent. In fact, they're, they're naive or in, innocent protagonists. Whereas the Flowers books are very decadent and strange and, and bent in a lot of different ways. And I don't really want, if I want to write about bent teenagers, I'll write about bent teenagers, but it's not what I'm trying to do right now. Yeah. Well, with all the novel work going on, are you still gonna do the short fiction? Yeah, I've sold uh, almost 30 stories this year. I Great. continue to produce, I continue to write, not at the volume I did, uh, simply because there's only so many things you can do with your time. Yeah. Um, but for the same reason I started out in short fiction, the love of experimentation and the flexibility it gave me, I wanna continue with short fiction. If nothing else, it just gives me a chance to try new things. If I wanna write a novel about something else, for example, uh, I've got two novels in progress that I've written and sold short fiction from. One is a story about Nikolai Tesla and Harry Houdini coming back from the dead to wage war on an immortal Guglielmo Marconi. So I wrote backstory for that and I've sold a couple of those pieces to cool. set up the weirdness in the story. The other one is a, is a novel about the Old West, a magical history of the Old West, uh, where Lewis and Clark meet, uh, meet the ruins of biblical Eden, Eden in the Missouri Breaks up in Montana. Wow. So we've got, we got more short fiction coming from you. Yeah. We've got at least two novel series. Um, we've run out of time. I want everyone to be looking for these novels out there. Keep your eyes open for Jay thank Lake you. short fiction as well. Jay, I want to thank you very much for taking time uh, from a family visit to uh, visit with us here at Fast Forward. Well, it's been a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Okay. And so from all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.